thank you for joining us today. Uh, here's a brief uh, land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we, as part of Nation State of Canada, have broken faith with the indigenous nations of Turtle Island through the dishonoring and breaking of many and varied treaties. Here in Kitchener-Waterloo, we acknowledge these lands as traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee confederacies. The Haldeman Track was promised to the Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River. Um, currently, less than 5% remain as reserve lands. Um, before that, however, the land was inhabited by many nations from time immemorial, contributions by the indigenous people, the Indi Inuit people and Métis people are in every sphere of life. We are mindful of broken covenants and we strive to make this right with the land and with each other. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, newcomers in this generations or generation past. I urge us all to read the calls of action by the Truth and Reconciliation Report. Let's take a moment to reflect on how we can implement these calls to action in our circle of influence. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, so just to get us started, uh, well, I'll call upon Sister Mifra Abid uh, for, as the coordinator of the Together Against Islamophobia program with the Canadian uh, Coalition of Muslim Women. Thank you, Fatima. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm here today as a victim of the assault that happened yesterday at the drive test Kitchener uh, in this very same plaza. My name is Mifra Abid and I work with the Coalition of Muslim Women as the coordinator of the Together Against Islamophobia program. Our program runs a hate, and, um, hate reporting line and helping victims of hate and racism is literally what I do for a living. This piece of information feels wildly ironic but is also extremely relevant to this incident. So much of my work entails training people to be active bystanders in the face of hate and creating awareness about recognizing hate and reporting it. And yet, when I was confronted by hateful behavior yesterday, when I heard the hurtful expletives being said out loud against brown people, when I was hit, when I asked them to stop, I went into physical shock. I couldn't process what had just happened. When someone asked me my number, just after the incident, I couldn't even recall my own number. Nothing really prepares you for something like this. And it really begs the question, why would anyone treat anyone like that? Just because of how they look or how they dress? Why is hate so easy? And why can't we give each other a chance instead? This is why I'm here, to say it again, that our society should have no place for hate. The color of your skin or the faith you follow should never be reason for someone to treat you as inferior. When someone uses expletives against brown people, they are harming a whole spectrum of people. Brown people can be Muslims, or Sikhs, or Hindus, or Christians. Brown people can be Canadians, they can be immigrants, they can be born right on this land as well. Most of us here are settlers, and if we do not recognize that, we do the history of this land a huge disservice. I also want to mention how overwhelming the outpour of support has been from this community. My phone has not stopped ringing or pinging since yesterday, and this is a truly heartening sign for me. People have gone out of their way <clears throat> to offer support and solidarity and prayers. This is Canada for me. We are good people, and we look after each other, and we strive towards kindness. To be clear, I have received many nasty, hateful messages on social media too, but the vast majority of messages have been incredibly kind and I would much rather focus on the good. I also want to acknowledge the Waterloo Police Services for the prompt response in making the arrest. I want to highlight some things in this case. When the officers were coming to my home to get a statement, I expressed discomfort of having police cars and uniformed officers in my driveway. I didn't want to scare away my kids. The WRPS EDI team then sent an unmarked car with plainclothes policemen to my house, and I appreciate this gesture. A victim should not have to worry about added fears when they are already in a vulnerable situation, and I'm happy to know that this option was made available to me. 
I was also given constant updates on how the case was progressing, especially from the EDI unit. Again, if we want victims to report hate crimes, it is crucial that they are made to feel like stakeholders in the process towards justice. This includes giving them their occurrence number, keeping them in the loop for follow-ups and so on. And I truly appreciate the Waterloo Police for taking these steps. That being said, I also want to acknowledge the privileges that I have and be cognizant that these privileges may not be available to all racialized people who experience hate. As a professional anti-racism advocate, I have a fair understanding of the systems that need to be navigated. <clears throat> I have direct access to law enforcement and even to mental health supports because of the nature of work that I do. And most importantly, even though my skin color is brown and I also wear a visible symbol of my faith, the hijab, I can communicate in English fluently. <clears throat> Sorry, I can in communicate in English fluently, which to be honest, makes accessing help so much more easier. I do not want to take these privileges for granted, but I also hope that everyone realizes that not all victims have access to these privileges and therefore would require more patience and support when they reach out to help. I want to take the opportunity to call for real substantive changes to better deal with hate crimes in this country. We at the Coalition of Muslim Women and National Canadian Council of Muslims call on the federal government to, number one, make good on its commitment to establish a national support fund for survivors of hate, and number two, to develop new hate crime legislation. We call on the provincial government to, number one, deliver an anti-racism strategy that requires social service agencies to provide regular training on anti-racism and anti-Islamophobia for frontline staff, and number two, to invest in public education about Islamophobia and all forms of hate. At the risk of repeating myself, I urge everyone to report hate if they experience or witness it. That's the only way we create change. I can tell you firsthand that being assaulted changes something inside you. It hits you not just at the skin level, but triggers something, some deep fears and anxiety within. This is not something anyone should have to experience, but if you do, please report it or intervene in whatever way is safest to do so. But please, please do not be passive bystanders. Lastly, I would request everyone to refrain from demonizing anyone. We are open to restorative justice practices when there, where there's healing on all sides. We should always be open to dialogue and engagement, and I pray for safety and peace for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Mifra. Uh, next, I'd like to call upon Sister Sara Shafiq, uh, who's the Director of Advocacy, Research, and Youth Programming at the Coalition of Muslim Women. Thank you so much. We are gathered here today to not only express our support to Mifra Avid, our dear colleague, CMW's Together Against Islamophobia coordinator, and a visible equity, diversity, anti-hate advocate in the community, but we'd also like to talk a bit about the response to the incident from the police, the community, and what we think are steps that can be taken to counter hate. Firstly, we are still coming to terms with the violent incident that happened to Mifra yesterday. We can only imagine how she's feeling. What she experienced was uncalled for, tragic, and completely unacceptable. She is a brave Muslim woman who stood up to hate, and we commend her for that. Unfortunately, she was the one who was also deeply affected as a result of being a voice of um, courage. We appreciate the quick work done by the uh, police in finding, arresting, and charging the Hamdur in hate-motivated incident against Mifra. We are also grateful that they spend, sent an unmarked car and an officer in plain, plain clothes to follow up with Mifra out of abundance of caution for her and her family's safety. Having a police car with flash lights flashing showing up outside one's ho house, especially if you're a visible minority, can add to the negativity already experienced by the victim. It's important to remember that a lot of incidents may go unreported simply because people from visible minorities and racialized communities may fear backlash from the community and are hesitant about becoming more prominent in the community if a co police car shows up at their house. 
As painful as the incident was, the outpouring of support, wishes, and solidarity with Mithra was very heartwarming. We are thankful to everyone that followed the post-incident unraveling and sent messages and thoughts via retweets, even emails. Communities coming together make us stronger against hate. But for the Coalition of Muslim Women of KW, the work doesn't end there. As an organization that works to actively counter hate and discrimination, racism, Islamophobia, we have to work through the shock caused by the hate-motivated crime to support not only MIFRA, but anyone that is affected by hate, racism, and discrimination. This incident drives a deeper conversation, drives a deeper conversation about doing more proactive and upstream work to educate and inform people about the effects of racism, hate, and discrimination. The incident also draws out attention towards the need for diversity, equity, inclusivity trainings for all public and private organizations that serve the community. What happened on May 17 highlights that conflict resolution, de-escalation, anti-Islamophobia, anti-racism trainings to be part of every organization's mandate, be it public or private. Thanks to the person that filmed the incident, as much needed evidence. The recording was very helpful in providing a different perspective on what Mifra experienced. Decent and kind citizens like that can be very helpful when it comes to countering, countering um, hate situation. However, keeping in mind everyone's safety, we encourage that active bystander training be provided by organizations to staff at schools, at workplaces, community groups, so we can all safely support anyone that may be experiencing hate in an outdoor space. I'd like to wrap up by saying the ripples of one hate incident can be felt by those far beyond the victim and their families. We must all constantly look within to amend behaviors that could cause harm to others. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Sarah Shafiq. And lastly, my name is Fatima Abdullah, and I'm here on behalf of the National Council of Canadian Muslims, or NCCM, a national civil liberties organization that focuses on advocating for the rights of Muslims uh, across Canada. It is deeply saddening to be here today in Kitchener to express just how appalled we are by the verbal and physical violence that Ms. Mifra Abid had to endure here yesterday. Hate crimes, as recorded by the police, have increased steadily in recent years. It is both harrowing and disappointing to see such an incident unfold, even in the most mundane of settings, a drive test center. What it shows is that Muslims, and particularly, particularly visibly Muslim women, continue to be the main targets of Islamophobic and racist attacks, even while performing mundane tasks and trying to get through their everyday errands. This cannot be the Canada that we live in. It cannot be the new normal. We have to stand for something better, and it's time that our elected officials stepped up to truly address hate and racism in our province and beyond. This starts with acknowledging the problem and educating the public. So today, I really want to echo Mifra Abid and the Coalition of Muslim Women's Calls for, re for the need for real change to truly address hate crimes in Ontario and beyond. I want to reiterate the call on the need for Ottawa to establish a national support fund for survivors of hate to develop new hate crimes, for survivors of hate, as well as uh, for, for Ottawa to develop new hate crime legislation. I want to echo for Ontario uh, that it is time to deliver an anti-Islamophobia and anti-racism strategy that requires social services agencies to train staff on anti-racism and anti-Islamophobia. It is also time to invest in public education about Islamophobia and all forms of hate and racism in our country. Thank you. We will now open up the floor for, for questions. While you said that you were listening to very negative comments on social media, how are you going to deal with those comments? I'm going to ignore them for now. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, I, I can't do much. I reported a couple of tweets, but I don't think it's going to help much. But then it's our job to report. And I'm just going to be reporting some of the tweets and ignoring the rest of them. Uh, 
I don't think it really helps to uh, report on Twitter, but then that's still what we have to do because that reflects on the, the what's the thing called? Not logistics. Um, algorithms. That reflects on the algorithm, sorry. Yeah, I think that's what we should keep doing, report. One more question to follow up to that. Because you're the CMW staff yourself and this unfortunate incidents had happened to you, but for any lay person in the community, where could they go to report and to go through this systemic change? So the Coalition of Muslim Women has an active hate reporting line called reportinghate.ca. We, uh, we actually take cases of hate crimes, hate motivated crimes, hate incidents, and even acts of discrimination. And you don't have to you don't have to identify as Muslim. Anyone who has faced racism can report with us um, and seek one-on-one -on -one support. That's really a unique feature of our hate reporting system. Um, yeah, just go to reportinghate.ca. And we also have a phone number. Uh, you can WhatsApp, you can text, you can email. I didn't quite hear why it was important for them, for the police to come quietly instead of with the big flashing lights. Could you talk more about what that, what the police response meant to you? So I have young kids and it's really frightening for them to see a police car with flashing lights coming to their house and, and you know, uh, coming in uniform and then the neighbors can ask, oh, what happened? Uh, did, did you do something? Did your parents do something? I didn't want my kids to go through that. And overall, uh, racialized folks have had some really problematic histories with the law enforcement and just being cognizant of that, uh, of the histories that they've had um, and to make them feel safer. That they're not to harass the victims, but also to make them like stakeholders in the process, uh, not to make them feel as if they have to pay a price for being the victim. Thank you. Was there anything in your experience with the police that you think could have been improved? Uh, again, I think it was fairly prompt and I got a lot of updates. Um, I, I think overall I had a positive experience and I hope this, this is uh, lent to everyone who reports with the police and I'm sure it does. And so, yeah, it's a good sign. Thank you. Are there mental health supports for those who may uh, experience hate? Where can they go to get that kind of support, social support? So if you report to the coalition, we do refer you to counselors for mental health supports and we pay the, we pay the cost for it. Uh, and we also have a great uh, system of referrals with many community partners, whether it's legal supports, mental health supports, uh, and others like system navigation. We'll immediately put you in touch with people who can best help you in the, in the shortest amount of time. talked about um, something very profound as to if this happened to a lay person who didn't have the opportunity to or didn't know what to do in terms of like reaching out to law enforcement at all um, to get that support that is needed. Um, could you just tell us a little bit more of what you can do if, because you're talking about your position, this is what you do every day, so you kind of knew a bit of how to manage it and where to go to. But for someone who doesn't know what to do and this happens to them, what, what can they do? I know you've talked about the report, um, reporting the crime. What's the, what does that look like for if someone would take that step? So we actually recognize this and that's why we started this hate reporting line to begin with because so many people would come to us with anecdotal experiences of, oh, this happened, but I didn't know what to do in the moment. And so, of course, if it's an emergency, we, we tell people to call 911 immediately. But if it's not an emergency, then they can call uh, or, or uh, log into uh, reportinghate.ca and we do the system navigation for them. And we are there for support, and we offer this uh, this service in multiple languages. So even if you don't speak your language, we'll get make sure that we have um, uh, an interlocutor or an interpreter who comes uh, to in, to translate for the victims. So yeah, there are a lot of um, bridges that need to be uh, a lot of gaps need, that need to be bridged. Sorry, uh, and we try to address those gaps by helping uh, individuals. But yeah, of course, uh, take a video, take evidence, write down whatever you've experienced, and so um, so you have a record of what happened. So when you can go to law enforcement, you know exactly what happened. In the Twitter video, you can uh, hear in the background people calling for security and whatnot. What was the drive test's response like in, 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 during that situation? Uh, again, because I'm an official witness to this case, I can't really talk to that. Uh, yeah, so I think I'll just skip that because I don't want to get into any legal trouble. Yet. <laughs> you said there was about 30 people and it was quite full in there. Were you a little surprised that you were the only one that jumped up to, to say anything? You could obviously everybody was watching it. Other people you said recorded it, but were you a little bit surprised that 
of maybe just with your background, you were ready to address it, but nobody else was just going to let that fly? I was definitely surprised because at one point I did ask everybody, is everyone just going to be sitting there and not do anything about it? Like, seriously, I got up and I spoke to the people around me, but nobody responded. And that's when I went to get help from some of the employees to intervene. Uh, that was my first response. But from my uh, from our training of active bystandership, we know that you know there is a there is a phenomenon called the bystander effect that if there are a lot of people, everybody thinks it's not my responsibility, and you really have to shake yourself out of that stupor and say, no, I am responsible, I am accountable, I need to take the first step. So uh, when we talk about human psychology, it is kind of expected, but I was still surprised because so I th I think from my estimate, 80 percent of the people were brown in that room, and when that person is using expletives against brown people. And I confirmed with people, did I just hear it right? Did she just say this? And they said, yes, she did. And nobody wanted to take a step. So that was sad, I think, for me, frustrating. Uh, I'm not sure if it's, a, it was kind of frustrating, yes. And, and, and we'll end it there. Thank you. Uh, we're just going to be around the area. So if there are any further questions, uh, I, I'm sure Mifra is happy to take them. Uh, I am on behalf of NCCM and, and so is Sarah. She